Okay, time to play some Mega Man. Let's see, Mega Man. Um, uh, wait, what's it? Mega Man? Well, it seems like my copy of Mega Man X is missing. Maybe there's some completely legal way I could play it on the PC. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, none of that really feels right to play Mega Man. And I don't think I want to play on one of these cheap Amazon imitation controllers either. What I really want to play it on is this, the real thing. So I think I'm just going to build an adapter to make it work. So this is what I want to do. Pretty straightforward. The controller goes into a microcontroller, like an Arduino or something. And then from there, we're going to send out keystrokes or maybe some kind of joystick input to USB on the computer. So you're going to need some basic stuff. For the microcontroller, I picked this. It's an Adafruit, Adafruit, however you say that, Pro Trinket. Seemed like the smallest form factor to do everything I want to be able to do with this. LEDs, whatever color you want. Resistors. A breadboard for prototyping, a pre-drilled printed circuit board. One of the harder things to acquire is going to be the actual sockets because I want to be able to plug in a Super Nintendo controller and not destroy the cable in some way. I want it to still work on any other Super Nintendo. So what I ended up doing was just going to eBay and getting a busted Super Nintendo from somebody and I'm going to take it apart and get these pieces out. Uh, maybe there's some cheaper way out there. I don't know. Um, but I wanted to actually do four player on mine, so I bought two of them, so I'll have four sockets. Some kind of project enclosure box to keep it all in. Uh, mine's a little bit big, so I'm going to have four controllers on it. And I think I got this thing off of Amazon. Some nylon standoffs and hardware uh, to mount everything inside the box. If you don't want to have to permanently solder your microcontroller to the board, you can get some of these little socket things. And there's probably some other odds and ends you're going to need along the way, but let's get started. What I need to do first is figure out what kind of signals are getting sent from the Super Nintendo motherboard to the controller and vice versa. In order to do that, I need to look at an oscilloscope output while probing the pins, but I don't have an oscilloscope. Fortunately for me, someone else has already done this, so we're just going to take a look at their work. So thanks to Jim Christie. On the first pin, you need 5 volts. Then you have a data clock, then a data latch, and then the serial data. These next two pins are actually not used, and the final pin is just for ground. This is what the protocol looks like. First, the Super Nintendo sends out a 12 microsecond wide pulse on the data latch line. After this, there's a 6 microsecond delay, and then the data clock starts sending out pulses. The data clock is normally high, so each pulse drives it low and the pulses are six microseconds wide on each half of the duty cycle, so 12 microseconds total. The controller is storing the state of each button as a bit, and every time the data clock drives low, the next most significant bit is shifted out onto the serial data line. Then, when the clock goes high, that bit is captured by the Super Nintendo. This repeats 16 times before all button states are saved. All we need to do is recreate this protocol using a microcontroller. This is the order of the buttons as they get shifted in. Seems kind of arbitrary, but it shifts in B, then Y, then select and start and so on. We'll need to know this once we're converting our input to some kind of USB output. So here's a more detailed schematic. This is just the pinout of the Pro Trinket. So you've got ground, you've got five volts coming from USB, and uh, each LED just has a series resistor. So this LED is going to come on when the device comes on. This one is when uh, controller 1 is plugged in, controller 2 is plugged in, controller 3, and controller 4. For each controller, you just have the data line plugged into the pin itself with a pull-up resistor going to plus 5 volts. So controller 1, 2, 3, 4. And then uh, clock and latch can be shared between each controller. So just got 0 for latch and 1 for clock. All right, so now I need to get these Nintendos apart. And Nintendo makes this a challenge. They put some kind of specialty screws in here so that a normal screwdriver or whatever tools you have laying around aren't gonna work. Uh, but I was able to order this special, this special bit that fits on them. And I should be able to just put this. Yeah, I mean, that isn't great. Doesn't really stay that well, but uh, yeah, that ought to work fine. Uh, or you could just bust the thing open. 
Okay, let's try to get this thing opened up. What am I doing? So my second Nintendo seems to have a pair of stripped screws. Uh, so I'm not sure what I'm gonna do to get these out, but let's see what we can do. Stab by some plastic. Anyway, I am gonna have to desolder this circuit board from each of these, I think. Don't think I can reuse this board. I desoldered each of the sockets from its board, and then I use a hacksaw to cut them in half and cut off a few end pieces to make them fit better in the box. I also saved these little snap-on front pieces here that have an indicator of if it's player one or player two, depending on how many dots, so I'm gonna add some more dots. I soldered wires to the pins on each of the sockets, and I've just got one up here to test with, and it's got a controller plugged in, as you can see, and I've got everything breadboarded and programmed. Uh, I do have to make one adjustment to the schematic. So, pin 13 on this particular Pro Trinket seems to have a problem, so I had to move that down to pin 14, also called analog in zero. So, let's take this crappy wire that I've got and plug it in and see what we get. As you can see, we now have power going to this, which is the on LED, and power going here, which is the controller one LED, which is where I have this plugged in. So this is the serial data line. It's plugged in for controller one right now. So if you actually navigate to control panel, hardware and sound, devices and printers, then you'll see there's this thing called Pro Trinket SNES. That's what I named the controller when I programmed it. So that's how it shows up and you can actually go to something called Game Controller Settings, and then you get this, and you can see there are four of these game pads currently plugged in, uh, even though there's only one actual device. So that's what we want, four players. And then if you click on Properties, it'll bring you to a test page, which shows all the buttons for the device, and then if I actually press buttons on the controller, you can see it lights up the corresponding button. Now let's take a look at the code. I started by grabbing this Pro Trinket gamepad library, and then I modified it to do what I really need to do. So I'll put a link in the description. Of course, this is programmed with Arduino. And at the top here, we just have some setup. So I'm including an external library called Pro Trinket gamepad. Then I'm defining a few pins. So I've got my clock and latch pins, uh, data for each of the four controllers, LEDs for each of the four controllers, and the on LED. The buttons come in in kind of a weird order by Nintendo's logic, so this is just remapping them to uh, a more logical order. Controller data is the raw data we're getting for each controller, lag whether or not the controller is plugged in, and this is the data after remapping it. So in setup, of course, we do some setup. We set a few inputs and outputs depending on uh, which pin we're working with. And then we have to call this begin function from the library that we were including. Let's take a look here at our main loop. The first thing we do is we wait for 16.67 milliseconds. If you remember from the timing diagram, this is how long it is before we actually start looking at controllers and driving that latch line and all that. Immediately after that, we just turn off all the LEDs. We're gonna actually set those somewhere here in the loop, so we're just gonna start them all at off. The next thing is this check controllers function. And as the name implies, all we're doing here is reading each of the data lines, and if we get a value, then we know that the controller is connected, and we're gonna turn on the LED to a somewhat dim level, otherwise we know that it's not connected. Next, we call read controllers. 
Inside of this function, we're gonna start off just by clearing the data for every controller. Next, we're going to write a one to the latch line, followed by a 12 microsecond delay, and then we're gonna write it low again. This is that initial pulse that we saw in the timing diagram. Remember that even though there are not 16 buttons on the controller, there are 16 values we have to read in. A few of these button values are just unused. So we're kind of simulating the clock here. So we're gonna wait for six microseconds, write the clock low, then wait for another six microseconds, write the clock high. We're just gonna do that every part of this loop and that's gonna make that clock signal that was in the timing diagram. And when the clock is low, we're able to read in data. And if you haven't done much embedded programming, this is gonna look kind of weird. But remember that each variable for data is just an integer, but we're kind of treating it like it's an array of bits. So we're gonna capture each bit in the least significant portion. And every time the clock strikes, we're going to move that bit over until eventually the first one we captured is in the most significant position and the last one we capture is in the least significant bit position. On each cycle of the clock, we're gonna shift over what's currently stored. And then we're going to do a bitwise or with whatever we read on the data line. So if we read a zero on the data line, well, it remains a zero on that least significant bit. But if it's a one, then we've got zero, 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 one being ORed with something that's definitely a zero on the end. So we store that one at the end of our data. And after we've done this for all 16, we just have to invert each of them because these are active low, not active high. So we wanna make sure that we're storing this properly. Next, for each controller, we're just gonna check if it's connected. And if so, we're gonna map the buttons. I know this looks really strange, but all this is doing is taking the controller data and rearranging it so that the buttons are in the order that I define them to be in the button map at the beginning. Now this is a little bit of extra functionality I added in here. So I'm only writing a sort of dim level to the LED when it's detected that it's plugged in. And then I'm just checking if we actually had any data coming in on that controller, we're gonna write it to a brighter level. This will just give a very faint flashing effect as I push buttons, kind of a quick debug. And next, we pass all of our button data into the Trinket Gamepad library right here. Now, I'm not gonna try to explain all of this code. I didn't write most of it, I just made some modifications, and it's pretty low-level stuff. The first thing I had to change was the HID descriptor. That stands for Human Interface Device Descriptor, and this describes exactly what the controller looks like. So as you can see, I've got these four sections here, each one describing one of the controllers. Uh, originally, I think there was just one, maybe two of these in here, and they had a slightly different description, but you'll have to do your own studying if you wanna learn about HID stuff. I also had to edit this move function in the C++ file so that it takes in four button masks. It has to rearrange each of those into eight bit integers, and then it calls this send, and I also had to rewrite this section a little bit so it would send these different buffers in the right order. Like I said, it's super low level stuff and I didn't write it to begin with, so I was just sort of following what I saw in front of me and made some changes. Uh, again, I'll try to post this online and put a link in the description in case you wanna just grab it for yourself. And that's it for the code. So up next, it's time to build it. One year later. Not really looking forward to cutting a tiny little hole for this USB input here. So instead of doing all that, I got this little USB adapter. So I'm just gonna cut a hole and run this through and it'll just kind of hang out the end like a dongle or something. And I also need to cut the controller inputs a little bit shorter. They don't quite fit in here with these little corner pieces on the box. Um, and then in order to mount them, uh, instead of being able to run screws straight through the front, I'm going to use little corner brackets. So place them kind of like that with the input over here, and this is just sort of holding it in place so when the controller's plugged in, it won't push it out.
and that's it. It's done. There was some crackling that occurred on the paint a couple days after it dried. Maybe that's because it was out in cold temperatures. I don't know. But aside from that, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Nothing left to do but try it out. And I bet there's some way to play Nintendo games with this too. I don't know. I am thinking of how I might be able to modify it so that it works with a Switch, but we'll see how that goes. In the meantime, if you found this helpful or entertaining, feel free to like and subscribe. Or don't. I'm not your mom. Oh, and if anyone has any recommendations for a better way to cut a square hole in a box, please let me know in the comments. The hot knife thing was kind of tedious.